Good morning, everyone. I got one wave from the back of the church. Let's try that again. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, who is thankful for the sunshine this morning? Both hands in the air, yeah. Praise the Lord. Uh, welcome to Elmwood Mennonite Brethren Church. My name is Pastor Conrad. If you're visiting, uh, welcome. If this is your first Sunday, welcome. And uh, if you've been here for a long time, welcome. And if you're just coming back after a long time, welcome. Good to see you guys here as well. Uh, we have here this morning, we are grateful that you've joined us to worship. Uh, we want to worship God this morning, the great God of the universe. Together we'll be singing songs of worship to God, uh, who reveals himself in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, where we read this, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And we'll be learning about him this morning as through the preached word, we'll be singing songs of worship to him together. And for those of you online, we uh, pray that you'll be singing uh, loudly in your homes as well. Uh, we're continuing in our series on the book of Nehemiah. And so if you've just joined us this morning, uh, you can actually hear the old uh, sermons for the last three weeks on our website. You can go there, there's a link, and also the YouTube channel, Elmwood MB Church. There's a chance for you to uh, check out the last three weeks, and I encourage you to do that. Um, we also have next week Elton De Silva, the executive director of the Canadian MB Conference. He's going to be preaching on Nehemiah chapter 6. And he'll be here and he'll also be in adult Sunday school. So if you have any questions about the MB Conference, which some of us may have uh, these days, uh, I encourage you to come to 9.30 for that. Two Sundays from now, which will be June the 5th, we're going to be having a family meeting, otherwise known as a congregational meeting. And it's going to be happening at uh, 10.45. What we're going to do is we're going to switch things around. So two weeks from now, uh, instead of coming for Sunday school at 9.30, which we normally do, you're going to come for church at 9.30. And then at 10.45, you're going to head downstairs. Those who are members are specifically requested to come. Everyone is invited to come. And uh, there'll be coffee and there'll be cinnamon buns, I've been told. And we're going to gather around the table. We're going to talk. We're going to share about some of the good things that God's doing. And then we're going to discuss uh, some of the things that are happening in our church. There is a report that's been put out. It looks like this. Uh, also, if you're new here, and you want to check out what the church is like, grab one of these. There's a couple of reports from the pastors. It gives you an idea of what's been happening this past year. And kids, uh, we're going to have snacks too in two weeks. I don't know if we'll get cinnamon buns, but we'll get something. So when the adults go downstairs, the kids will go up to Sunday school and we'll do something up there. Uh, this coming week, mom's group is still going on, Wednesdays at 9.30. Our last youth group on a Thursday night is this week. And so ages... Uh, uh, grade 6 to grade 9, you're welcome to come. It's at 7 o'clock here. We're meeting on Thursday, talking about living out the truth. And next Monday, not this Monday, but next Monday, we have the opportunity to go again to Union Gospel Mission. And so if you want to come and you want to serve, um, there's a group that's going to be doing a chapel service, doing the music and the speaking. You don't have to do that, but if you want to come and clean or serve soup or wipe floors or just say hi to people, uh, meet at church at 6.30, and Damien here is going to be leading that, so if you want to go, give him a contact, or also just contact the office. Next thing is, is it's summertime soon, and one of the privileges as a church is that this year we get to have day camp again, and we're going to be doing two weeks of day camp, and one of the really benefits of living in this province, and you may not realize it, but we actually get some green team grants, and so we got a green team grant, and I asked you uh, last time I was up here to pray for someone to serve on staff, and... There she is. Um, Annika. I had thought about Annika, but she had a job, but God worked it out that she now has a new job with us. So we're thankful for that. And she'll be starting this week part-time while she's still finishing off high school. And, uh, you know, we do day camp for a couple of reasons. One, we want to teach the gospel to kids in a way that they can understand and in an era that works for them. We also want to spread the gospel to our community and to non-church friends and family that you might have and provide opportunity for people in this church to actually serve and for the generations in the church to mix together. So registration forms are available. They were sent out online. They're also at the back there. They look like this. Uh, and I just want to encourage you, if you're taking some of these for your own kids, it's great. If you're taking some of these for your non-church friends, that's great. If you're taking some of these for your cousins who go to three different VBSs during the summer, that's not great. Because um, we don't have enough room for that. So this, uh, our camp is designed for those in our community uh, those in our church community, and those you know who don't know Jesus. Uh, I remember, remember years ago I was working at a camp, and a kid's like, this is my fourth one this summer. And I was like, I'm subsidizing you for cheap childcare. That's not what we're doing. We want to reach out with the gospel. So this is for you to make friends in your neighborhood, 
kids who don't know Jesus, invite them to come. Registration forms are there. There's going to be a great theme. Uh, it's, uh, it's called Zoomerang. Uh, it has to do with Australia. Uh, returning to the value of life. And in the world where we're fighting uh, and abortion is hot in the topics, um, this is a really good, good theme to be talking about. The beginning of life, the wonder of life, the value of life, eternal life, and using your life. As soon as I read those five things, I'm like, I can get behind this. This is going to be good. So that's coming up. And if you want to help, uh, we do need help. Talk to Alana Middlestadt if you want to help at the preschool day camp. Talk to myself if you want to help at the elementary age. We could use your support. We're looking to hopefully have 50 kids one week, 30 kids another week. And that'll take a lot of people. Let me, uh, one of the verses for day camp is this. Psalm 139, verse 14. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful all your works, my soul knows it very well. So let's praise God together who has made us this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can be here. Thank you for the people that you brought in on this beautiful Sunday morning. God, we recognize that as we've gone into this week, there's been people who've dealt with all kinds of weather issues and frustrations and can't get to cottages. Uh, but maybe there's people here, here this morning who weren't going to be here. And so we ask you, God, this morning to work through your Holy Spirit to draw us to you. Thank you, God, that you are worthy of worship, that you've created us, that you love us, that you know us. And we look forward to knowing you more as a result of this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. I invite you to stand with us as we join our voices together and sing the solid rock. Oh, hero of heaven. 
Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. You've been faithful through every storm, you'll be faithful forevermore, you have done great like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. The lyrics in the next song, Only a Holy God, the verses are rhetorical questions because the answer is, of course, only a holy God. The first verse speaks of God's sovereignty. He is the ruler above all creation, from heavenly angels to earthly rulers to the forces of evil, all submit to him. The second verse speaks more of God's holiness, that he is more ho beautiful than any other, brighter than the sun and also the only ruler who is just. The third verse is of God's power, strength, and might. The chorus, a call to worship him because of these things. It's our proper response to who he is, to look upon him and praise and sing aloud. He is, worth worship of our, he is worthy of our worship for his attributes. The fourth verse is about the gospel. The same God who is so holy, so glorious, and powerful, whose goodness cannot stand any sin, this same God came to save us. And so again, our response is to worship. I invite you to join us in singing only a holy God. Rules with 
are sovereign over creation, the light that defeats darkness. You are more beautiful than the most beautiful thing we can ever imagine. Your power, strength, and might we can cling to when we feel the world crumbling around us. And you can release each of us from sin's enslavement. Because of all these things, we bring all glory and honor to you and thank you. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. The inheritance of Jesus will include a great multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language. Many people groups in the world today, however, have yet to receive a gospel messenger. They are people living in darkness. They are without hope and without God in the world. They are the unreached. The majority of the unreached live where most of us will never travel. They are far removed from us economically, politically, and culturally. Yet these are those for whom Christ Jesus has died. Among them will be those whom God will save for his glory. Are we praying that the light of Christ would dawn on those living in the land of darkness?
More than two billion have never had the opportunity to hear the gospel. Those identified as the unreached are people belonging to populations with common ethnicity, language, and religion, have fewer than 2% evangelical believers. Over one-third of all people groups in the world are classified as unreached. Pray for increased access to the gospel. Jesus instructed his disciples to pray that the Lord would send more workers into the abundant harvest fields. More workers are needed to bring in the crop which is ripe. Pray that the Lord would raise up messengers to go to the uttermost parts of the earth. Pray that these servants would be faithful in making known the glorious riches that are in Christ. No one can come to Jesus unless the Father draws him. The church will only see fruit when the Holy Spirit is at work. Pray that God would be working in the hearts of peoples everywhere, revealing to them the truth about his Son. Here's a brief story to encourage you. In the 1970s, Tahir served as a missionary in northern India. On occasion, he would travel to visit his brother-in-law, a doctor who lived on the other side of the state. While there, Tahir met people who would come seeking medical advice. Among those who came were Toya, a people previously unknown to Tahir. He learned that they had no knowledge of Jesus, but began to pray for them as God laid their need for salvation on his heart. The Lord began directing him to be the answer to his own prayer. When support for his existing ministry was drastically cut, he prayed about how to engage with this group. He and his wife moved closer to the Toya people and began a small Bible school in order to reach them. Several students came to the school from the Toya and met Christ during their studies. When they graduated, they went back to share Christ among their people. A movement began. God has blessed their witness so that among the Toya today, nearly 10% name Christ as their Savior. Will we be a generation that pays attention to those with no active gospel witness? Will we be a generation that prays? Join me in prayer, please. Heavenly Father, in this hour or so that we come to worship you as your body here at Elmwood Church, we pause many times to pray as we begin, as we sing, as we read your word, as our pastor presents the lessons of the text before us this morning, and as we are sent into this dark world as beacons of your light. Why do we come before you in prayer? We pray because as Moses reminded us, who is like you, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders, who leads in steadfast love the people whom you've redeemed? Truly you are our strength and our song and you have become our salvation. You are our God and we will praise you. And yet, Lord, we confess that we are truly homesick. We have a deep lifelong hunger to be reunited fully with the one who created us, from whom our sin has cut us off from the completeness of relationship that we know you desire for us to experience. And so we cry out to you in prayer, albeit not enough, for not as long as the needs are many, and admittedly to our own shame, as James tells, us, James tells us, we often ask with wrong motives that we may spend what we get on our own pleasure. You have said, O Lord, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. But how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard, and how are they to hear without someone preaching, and how are they to preach unless they are sent? Yet, Lord, as we have just heard, two billion in this world are without a gospel witness to proclaim the excellencies of Jesus, to 
Call them out of their darkness into his marvelous light. Lord Jesus, you reminded us that because the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few, that we need to pray earnestly that the Lord of harvest of the harvest would send out laborers into his harvest. And so we pray that this morning, that not only would there be increased access to the gospel throughout many mediums, but that more messengers and church planters would go to the unreached. And we, we admit that in making such a bold request of you, we know this may mean that we or our children would be the subjects of your call and your equipping for such a radical and glorious mission to the uttermost parts of the earth. So we lift up before you this day those who have already obeyed your call and have gone to share the gospel with those who've never heard it before. We pray for their faithfulness, for their encouragement to understand how to speak with grace, using their time wisely, building relationships of trust that demonstrate the beauty of Jesus. Would you protect them, we pray, in the midst of opposition and provide for their ongoing support and their steadfastness in this work. Lord, we continue to pray for a cessation of hostilities in the Ukraine. As fantastical as such a request sounds after so many days of war, we recall how often you acted on behalf of your nation Israel, ending battles and wars in a singular event that displayed your sovereignty over all. And so we pray boldly for this. For those among us facing health issues this day or simply not able to be here in our midst on Sunday, we pray for encouragement and a confidence deep within them that they are upon our hearts and truly loved. In particular this week, we pray for Katie Berg, Linda Croker, and Ernie Enns. And Lord, because you invite us to come in confidence for mercy and grace to help in time of need, we remember those whose homes and livelihoods have been, in some instances, destroyed due to flooding, and some forced to evacuate, others fighting desperately to sandbag and pump. Lord, in your mercy, would you hear our prayers? And Lord, as the passage of our sermon is now read, would you By your Holy Spirit, give us a thirst to understand. And would you give Ken your guidance to speak the water of life with a fearless commitment to truth. In the mighty name of Jesus, we ask all of this. Amen. Our reading this morning is from Nehemiah 5, verses 1 to 13. You might want to open that in your Bible and follow along. Now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. For there were those who said, With our sons and daughters we are many, so let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. There were also those who said, We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. And there were those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards, And now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers, our children are as their children. And yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but it is not in our power to help it, for other men have our fields and our vineyards. I was very angry when I heard their outcry in these words. I took counsel with myself and I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. I said to them, You are exacting interest, each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them and said to them, We, as far as we are able, have bought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations. But you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us. They were silent and could not find a word to say. And so I said, The thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not walk to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us abandon this exacting of interest. Return to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, and their houses, 
and the percentage of money, grain, wine, and oil that you've been exacting from them. And then they said, we will restore these and require nothing from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priests and made them swear to do as they had promised. I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, so may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep this promise. So may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assemblies said, Amen. And praise the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. This is God's word for us this morning. Amen. Well, good morning. If you have your Bibles, uh, if you haven't opened it up to Nehemiah 5, uh, this would be a great time to do that. That's our text this morning, uh, the passage that Phil read for us. Um, That is is where we're going to give thought and attention and by God's help um, find the application for our lives and for our church. Um, As you know, uh, we've been walking through the book of Nehemiah. We'll be staying in that right up until summertime. And Nehemiah is a character. He's He's the main guy. He's the main main character of the book of Nehemiah, which is named after him. Uh, And so we're kind of following his life as he returns to the city of Jerusalem, um, which represents the people of God as as, as he comes in to play an instrumental role in rebuilding the wall around the, the city of Jerusalem. And for the last hundred years before he comes, the exiles of Israel have been returning from Babylon in to Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. And we're in this book as a church intentionally. Nehemiah was there helping rebuild the city, helping rebuild the identity, the security, the direction of the people of God. And here we are, uh, in, in many ways, feeling like we've come out of an exile of the last two years of a pandemic wondering how do we rebuild a faith community? How do we rebuild our world? And we know, we know that the world has changed, we know that the church has changed, and if we're honest, we know that we have changed. But how have we changed? That's an important question. How have you changed over these past two years? Are you, are you better? Are we a better people, collectively? Globally, are we better people here at Elmwood? Are we, right now, are we healthier spiritually? Is our walk with Christ more intimate, more transparent, more joyful? Is our walk with him more dependent and more trusting? Is our relationships with others more honest, more vulnerable, more accountable, more upbuilding and uplifting? Or have these areas of our lives been torn down and, and here we are looking at the rubble or what remains after these last two years? The people of Israel return to Jerusalem and they find the gates are burned, the temple is destroyed, and the walls are a heap. And they would be asking themselves, who would we become? What's left? Who will we be? Could we reclaim our former glory? And I'm sure many of the returning exiles wondered this question. Could we get back to who we were before this all happened? Could we get back to a place where we just like, you know what, the the past just didn't happen. Here we are and we're moving forward. But this begs a very, very important question. Is what they were really a good thing? Had they changed for the better? Is going back to what they were years ago actually a good thing? Nehemiah, last week we looked at um, 
uh, opposition from outside. They were trying to rebuild a wall, and there's characters that are putting pressure on them uh, and, and trying to discourage them and threaten them. Uh, and next week, we'll actually pick up again these outside pressures saying, uh, trying to crush down um, God's people. But this morning, this chapter, as Phil read for us, there's a different challenge. It's an internal challenge. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 9 it says, whoever walks in integrity walks securely. Whenever we look back on our lives and we say, boy, only if we were as we used to be, we assume that we were walking securely and we were living with integrity back then. Which brings us to our chapter in Nehemiah today, the rebuilding nation of Israel was not walking securely, nor were they living with any integrity as is getting exposed. In fact, as much as the wall is being rebuilt, the fabric of their society, their identity as the people of God was eroding away and had been eroding away. In, in, in a lot, uh, main sense, they actually were returning back to normal. They were going back to be the people they were before they were taken to captivity. They were returning to their old ways, which was a bad thing. We've got to capture that. So, this word integrity. What does integrity mean? The Hebrew word um, suggests completeness, wholeness, fullness. So, that means no compromises, no shortcuts, no breaches or gaps, no refusals in the face of duty to shortchange your obligations and your words. No saying one thing and then going doing something else. And so, it's no surprise that when we lack integrity, that we have, uh, that's assuming we have a conscience that hasn't been seared by years of sin and rebellion, but it's no surprise that when we lack integrity, we feel empty don't we? We feel incomplete and actually dirty, even on the inside. Last week, um, we had a bunch of kids that were, were playing in our front yard. It was that one day where the sun was out. Remember that one day? We all remember that day. We had sunburns on our foreheads. Well, it was that day. We were outside, and, and one of our kids came in and said, we got to make lemonade. So we went and made lemonade. There's sugar all over the place, and, and, and the floor is sticky, but it was great. So we go out, and, and lemonade's out for the, the kids in the neighborhood. And then one by one, the cups come back. I'm not drinking that. I'm not drinking that. <laughs> and one kid said, did you guys wash your cups? And we had had a mango smoothie. And if you, a little, okay, this is not the sermon, but just like if you're washing your cups, if you've had mango, you've got to really wash that because it gets stuck on there. That's what, what happened to us. Um, so it looked awful and gross. And they said, We're not, we don't want to drink that because the outside of the cup looks fine, but the inside I don't, I, don't want to, I don't want to touch that. And, and this is how Jesus describes the religious leaders of his day, like a dirty cup. They're clean on the outside, but dirty on the inside. They're spending their time looking good without actually being good or even knowing what that means. They lacked integrity. They were incomplete. They were empty people, empty vessels. Jesus even says, you're whitewashed tombs. There's death inside of you. Titus chapter 1 verse 6 says they profess to know God, but, their action, but by their actions they actually deny him. And this is a sad turning of events of the people of God then, and we should be not surprised today. So Nehemiah 5, the break of integrity, um, is the, the crack in the, the fabric of their society is exposed. They are confronted. Nehemiah confronts them. Uh, and if you're new to the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah is this courageous, bold leader. And elsewhere he is, uh, we'll see at the end uh, of the book, he is, he is beating people because they're so rebellious to the way uh, God has called them to be. He is standing in the gap and not afraid to confront them. And finally the chapter ends with a wonderful example of integrity, and that's where we're, where we're going this morning. Here's Nehemiah, a master builder, but not necessarily of bricks and mortar, but he was a master builder of people. D.A. Carson well puts it, if the wall had been rebuilt without rebuilding the people, the triumph would have been very small. So here's a few observations of this chapter. The integrity is exposed in chapter 
uh, verses 1 to 5. The first little bit, their integrity is exposed. Up to this point, we've been listening to them rebuild the wall, a lot of activity and action, and all of a sudden there's a cry that rises out from within. There's an injustice that is occurring from within. There's a break of integrity from within. We say we're good and we're God's people, and yet we're treating those amongst us, the most poor among us, as though they were to be traded like property. A friend of mine from the Philippines, he was explaining to me once um, in his village how, uh, how some buildings were built to save money. Um, they'd uh, produce these large concrete pillars that would be the, the foundation, right? And, and at the top of them, you'd see rebar sticking out. If you're familiar with this, a new building project, the rebar is sticking out. That's generally a good thing. That means that there's rebar inside the concrete pillar. And what my friend told me, he said, what would happen to save money because steel is, ext- uh, is extremely expensive in his village, in his area, once the inspectors had gone through, if they had, they would pull the rebar up out of the concrete post. Leave one or two in, but they would pull most of it out to save money, and they'd just keep going up, keep going up, keep going up. Which meant you didn't have a concrete um, pillar, you ended up having a, a, a pillar of sand. The concrete is what gives it the strength, is what holds it together, makes it withstand when it bends and shifts as the ground moves and weight settles in upon it. The integrity of the building and those buildings were compromised. And sadly, you just need to look through world history and see the destruction of buildings where the the integrity, the strength, the soundness of the building was compromised because of shortcuts. Something internally was wrong in the nation of Israel. Something internally was wrong amongst the people there inside these rebuilt walls in Jerusalem. The the wall is being built at remarkable speed. Just over two months, the wall is being rebuilt. We'll get to that next week as it gets finished off. And they're fending off enemies on the outside, and it looks like all is going well until this outcry arises that there's a massive breach internally. As one writer says, what good was it to build a wall when inside the wall the people were exploiting one another? And that's exactly what's going on. Remember, the people of Israel, even though they're coming back to Jerusalem, they're still actually in slavery. They're still um, subject to the Persians. It was the Babylonians who'd conquered them. The Persians knocked off the Babylonians, still kept uh, Israel as one of their vassal states, and said, you guys can go back, but then here's the taxes we're requiring you to pay back to us. And you fast forward right into the New Testament, it's the Romans who then take over from the Persians, right? All this change of power, but the people of God are paying heavy taxes to these foreign nations. And this is continuing to go on. This is what's happening here. They're paying heavy, heavy taxes, uh, and they're overloaded. And so you have the situation, verses 1 to 5, where the people are owing Persia massive amount of money, and the poorest of the poor, which generally are affected the most when these situations happen, they can't do it. They can't pay it. And there's panic. We're mortgaging our fields. We're giving up our properties, our homes, which have been passed down through generations. We have to give it all up. How can we buy food? I mean, this is a great moment for leadership to show up and rescue and deliver and guide the people into a new way of living and how we're going to collectively come and deal with this. Instead, what we see here, the integrity that's exposed in chapter 5, is basically the leadership of uh, the Israelites at this point are, best way to describe them, would be, you remember in the movie, um, the Christmas movie, It's a Wonderful Life? Uh, Potter? Remember that guy? Potter. He had a first name somewhere. But he's, he's, the, wealth, he's, he's the bad guy. He is the, the wealthy land baron who is just trying to take over Bedford Falls. And, and when the depression hits, when the big financial crisis hits, and everyone's panicking, and they're basically giving him all their money, what does George Bailey say? Pot, what does he say? I have it written down. Don't you see what's happening? Potter isn't selling. Potter is buying. Don't you see what happens? He's not rescuing you. He is destroying you. He's trying to capture you. He might be, and so the people in Israel, they might, these leaders, they might be paying your taxes and lending you money. They're not lending. They are, 
they are capturing your lives. They're trying to snag you and all your property. In your weak moment, they're gathered. They're buying you up so there's nothing left. That is what is happening here. In essence, they filled the city of Jerusalem with money marts across the city to pay high taxes at a cost of really buying their lives. And so to the point where in verse 4, some of the children are being sold into slavery. I mean, you just got to think of that just for a moment. They've been in physical slavery in Babylon for 70 years. This is a people that remembers the exodus when they were in slavery in Egypt for 400 years. I mean, this is a people that knows what it means to be in slavery. You would think they, of all people, should get it. You don't sell your own people into slavery. Slavery is a bad thing. But that's what is going on here. Their integrity is exposed. Their love for one another was reduced to an economy. And nobody seems to notice it. It's just like business as usual. It's just going on. This is what we do. And as horrible as that is, and Nehemiah gets really angry. We'll talk about that in a minute. It actually reflects something far more awful. We sang about a holy God this morning. Only a holy God. Who can do all these great things? Only a holy, holy God. Here's the tragedy. The people of God that were living in Jerusalem, the nation of Israel, they were called the people of God. They were not acting like the people of God. They were acting like the people of the nations around them. They were returning to their old ways. But it was their old ways that actually brought them into slavery in the first place. Remember, we read this passage at the beginning of the series in 2 Kings 17. So this is the end of the story of Israel in, in 2 Kings. But they would not listen So God had been sending the messages, 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 and it says they would not listen and were as stiff-necked as their ancestors. So there's a generation of saying, we're not going to change our ways. We don't want to do what you want us to do, God. They're stiff-necked as their ancestors who did not trust in the Lord their God. They rejected his decrees and the covenant that he'd made with their ancestors and the statutes that he'd warned them to keep. They followed worthless idols and themselves they became worthless. They imitated the nations around them, and although the Lord had ordered them, do not do as they do. The tragedy here was that the people of God then and now were to be a light. Then and now were to be a sign pointing people to what it looks like and the experience of living at peace with God and with your neighbor, pointing others to the power and the life-changing reality of the kingdom of God that is within us. Second century early church father Tertullian, he wrote about how non Christians viewed the Christian community. So it's a budding faith community. This is what they saw, and this is what he wrote down. Look, they say, look how the Christians, how they love one another, for they themselves hate one another. And look how they're ready to die for each other, for they themselves are ready to kill each other. That was the people, that's how the people of God were to be. That's how they were to be known. That's how we are to be known. Because the kingdom of God is within us. And in this text, and we see it throughout Scripture, the integrity of their faith, their relationship with God, was tested when the weakest of the weak, the poorest of the poor, the most vulnerable in society came amongst them. How would they treat them? Would they trample them? Would they disregard them? Forget about them? So you're not like me, so I'm just going to give you attention. I'm not going to help you. And so rightly, they are called out on the floor for this. It begs important questions for us. If your integrity were exposed, right? If you're building, what would, what would be seen? Where would the cracks be? The model we have in Scripture about who we're to take care of, and, 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 and we're to be a loving people, which we all agree with and say yes and amen. But let's put some legs on that and, 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 and flesh out what that really means. First and foremost, if you're a follower of Christ, your first priority is your immediate family that God has given you to care for. Whether you have children or don't, whether you're married or not, you likely have parents, you likely have brothers, sisters, cousins. That's where you begin in fact, in 1 Timothy, 
Paul says, if anybody does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. You could really stretch that out. After, after, after that, it goes to your, your greater family, which is the church, the body of Christ. This is why we take membership seriously at Elmwood, so that you covenant with each other and say, I'm going to hold you accountable. You hold me accountable. I pray for you. You pray for me. We'll walk together in this life, this side of eternity, knowing we will worship Christ for all eternity together. The local church becomes the next priority. You're giving, you're caring, you're nurturing, you're prayer, you're visioning, you're volunteering and serving, you're using of your gifts in these ways to bless others and strengthen others. We know within our faith community, our active faith community, that there are very real needs, very real material needs that we look for ways to help and support. We've had a number of you come to us and say, COVID's been brutal and I got all these benefits that I'm not using. Do you know of someone who's lost a job or someone who's out of work for a while? Yes, we do, actually. A number of folks that are actively involved in our faith community that are members here. I say, here, go, go over there. Go visit with those folks. Help them find ways to support and strengthen them. So it's our immediate family, and it's our church family. And then really you stretch that out more globally into our global church family. We would spend some time this morning praying for the, glo- for the world for unreached people groups, that the church would send the gospel, the good news of Jesus, around the world. That there will be brothers and sisters that we have never met, that we will worship Jesus together with. Our priority goes to those folks, for missionaries and those who are serving in those communities to extend the gospel so that for the greater faith community. And, and then fourthly is, is the world that we live in, the brokenness of the world that we live in. Folks that come to you who have needs in your workplace, your neighbors, communities in, in your neighborhood. You care about the neighborhood that you live in. That it would, be, uh, it would experience the peace of God that transcends understanding. And God has placed you by his divine providence to extend his kingdom in that place. And so our giving and our caring is for the greater community as well. For those who don't know Jesus. We care for their material needs and their emotional and spiritual and physical needs because they are made in the image of God and worthy of dignity, worthy of love and grace. But here in our church, we have the poor among us. We have widows. We have the fatherless. We have the weak. We have those who do not fit in or find themselves not belonging anywhere. We have those who have to mortgage their pride and have to mortgage their interests just to fit in, just to belong and have people give them attention. But they belong to you. They're part of the family of God. They're not to be be kept in, no one is to be kept in emotional slavery because they cannot pay the high taxes of social and emotional IQ. They don't have to. They're family. (laughs) They're family. The door's open. Dinner's on at five. Come tell us what God's doing in your life. They're brothers and sisters in Christ. For Israel, at the time of Nehemiah, they were not family. In fact, the people around them were a means to get ahead, to secure a future for themselves. And that was what was exposed, but that was about to change. So the second part here, their integrity is now rebuilt. Their integrity gets rebuilt. and starts in verse 6 when Nehemiah gets really angry. He's such a great leader. There's so many wonderful things about Nehemiah. He's, he just gets, he's such a unique leader in that he's driven by a balance of wisdom and passion. Most guys, it's one or the other. All passion, no wisdom, lots of wisdom, but are you alive? <laughs> Nehemiah had both. And he's angry, and he goes away, and he thinks through this. He takes counsel by himself, he says, and then he thought it over. But he's angry because there's a wrong that's going and it's pervaded the nation. And he thought about this before he came steamrolling in. But the steam still came. He still brought the weight. Is anger such a bad thing? Eli Wiesel said the opposite of love is not hate. It's actually indifference. If he he didn't love them, he would have said, ah, well, yeah, that's a problem. But, yeah, what are you going to do? It's kind of been like that for a long time. I'm just kind of here to build a wall, and then I'm out because I got a great retirement back in Persia uh, and a great gig. 
No, he loved them and confronted them, spoke truth to them, and still got in and did the hard work. So look at how he rebuilds their integrity. He digs under the surface, confronts the wickedness there in verses 7 through 9. He says, this is not good. He doesn't say, sounds like you guys are on a journey. Sounds like you're working on it. Sounds like you've, you've made a couple good strides. It's good. Nonsense. This is not good. Calls an assembly and shames. He publicly shames the leadership. You guys should have known better. This is unacceptable. And what do they do? It's a great line. They do nothing. They are quiet. They're silent. They're busted. They're exposed. Everybody knows it. They know it. It's, it's either they hadn't seen it until he said it, and now they see it and go, this is, I cannot believe we just did this. I cannot believe we've been living like this. Or they're on the other side going, we're caught. Can't run. Either way, they are caught and they're quiet. It's a pivotal point. This is a really pivotal point in the development of the finishing of the wall and the development of the people of God. How often throughout history they are a people that God sends prophets to warn them, to confront them. Look at Jeremiah, the prophet. God tells Jeremiah, look, when you go and tell them these things, they're not going to listen to you. Well, there's encouragement for you. They're not going to listen to you. They're not going to answer. Jesus points out this has been the storyline of the people of God since day one, telling the parable of the vineyard, but it's summed up really well in Proverbs. Proverbs 9, do not rebuke mockers or they will hate you. Rebuke the wise and they will love you. Instruct the wise and they will be wiser still. Teach the righteous and they will add to their learning. So here they are at a pivotal point. Are they wise or are they fools? Are the leaders of Israel, what are they made of? Is the integrity completely shattered or is there some strength that remains? Well, they could have rejected Nehemiah. They could have turned on him and they could have killed him. Why not? He's going to affect their bottom line. He's changing and confronting and he's just embarrassed them. It's a very risky move. But these are not the same people that they were. They have changed. Something has happened, which is commendable to them. And listen to this, it's hopeful for you and I today. But we can change too. Verse 8, after he tears into them, they're quiet. They're nothing to say. They're busted. They know it. But, but, then, but then Nehemiah doesn't stop. He actually turns the, the arrow in on himself. He says, I'm not, I'm not above this. I'm not, me and my, my crew that I brought here from Persia, yeah, we're not above this. We're realizing, he is realizing that he also has been part of the game. And it leads to confession. Verses 10 and 11. They come to confession, corporate confession. What a reminder, even the most righteous among us. If we feel we are righteous, we're, this, is not, this is not me, this is not me. Nehemiah, it's Nehemiah. And even the most righteous of us need a gut check, need a perspective to look on how we spend our time, how we spend our money. Does it represent the kingdom of God or the kingdom of the world that we live in? I mean, those are hard things to think through and wrestle through and apply. But ask the questions, are we more like our neighbors and the world around us, or are we more like Christ? Are we more reflecting his values in the world or the world's values? Nehemiah didn't remove himself from the evaluation process. He confesses his sin, sin, and collectively they say, you're right. This has to stop. We will give it back. We will return what we've taken. In essence, repentance. We will turn around. We will change our ways. Sometimes we need to be confronted. Sometimes we need to be quiet and confess our situation that we are far from God's calling and his purpose in our lives. We are far from God's ideal. Sometimes we need to stop and stop defending ourselves, even to ourselves, and say, yes, that is true of me. I am, I am more interested in building my kingdom than having God's kingdom built within me. I'm afraid of that, what that could mean. I'm afraid of what the implications would be financially, relationally, in my career. Sometimes we need to stop and we pray, God, please help us, change us. And then what's the fruit of this? 
Right at the end there, verse, verse 13. And all the assembly said amen. We sing that song occasionally. And everybody said amen. They all said amen. We agree with this. And they praised the Lord and the people did as they had promised. Collectively, change direction. We're going to go this way now. It's being exposed. Light is being shone on the darkness of our hearts. We're now going to go collectively go this way. And when God confronts us with his truth, it is not to keep you in some slavery. It's to deliver you from the slavery that you're in. There was no integrity of the people. Now they're set free. Public confession. Wrongs made right. And the kingdom of God comes. Who's the little man up in the tree? Who? Nicodemus? No. Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. Nicodemus might have been a little guy. Hey, good thing. Uh, short jokes aside. We won't, do, won't go there. Um, Zacchaeus, right? He, he, can, he, he gives all his wealth. He, he repents publicly and the kingdom of God has visited that family today, Jesus says. What good news. What good, a, ri- a written off character in the community. And the kingdom of God comes and births something new in his life. So to that end, let's, let's wrap this up. Um, integrity is beautifully exemplified here at the last four or five verses of Nehemiah 5. Let me just read this for you, starting in verse 14. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor, so this is Nehemiah talking, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year to the 32nd year of Artaxerxes the king, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allowance of the governor. The former governors who were before me, they laid heavy burdens on the people, and they took from them for their daily ration 40 shekels of silver. Even their servants lorded over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. I also persevered in the work on this wall, and we acquired no land, and all my servants were gathered there for the work. Moreover, there were at my table 150 men, Jews and officials, besides those who came to us from the nations that were around us. Now what was prepared, now what was prepared at my expense for each day was one ox, six choice sheep and birds, and every ten days all kinds of wine in abundance. Yet for all this I did not demand the food allowance of the governor because the service was too heavy on this people. Remember for my good, O God, all that I've done for this people. We're told that Nehemiah is the governor of the area. He's been there for, uh, he's the governor for about 12 years. And the previous governors were given a picture here. They were, they were keeping the people down. They were demanding high salaries and, and food from the people, even though they're paying high taxes to Persia, the leadership is squeezing them, placing a heavy burden on the people. But Nehemiah stays focused on the building of the wall and doesn't take any payments. It's not about the money for him. Instead, he uses his wealth, elsewhere in the chapter, he uses his wealth actually to buy back people who are in slavery. He uses his money as a tool to extend the kingdom of God. That's what he's doing. God's right rule reign to be extended in the people. So he uses that money not to build his empire, but to rescue people, to deliver them from oppression that they were in. He saw it, money was simply a tool to extend God's kingdom. And then, and then this crazy hospitality, 150 people a day. Imagine sending that text. Uh, hey, dear, I'm, I'm going to be home a little bit late, and there's some people coming with me. What's in the freezer? 150 people is coming for dinner tonight and tomorrow and Thursday and Friday. And yes, your mom can come too. 150 a day at his cost. He truly lived out Matthew 22. Teacher, Jesus has asked this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? To which Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment, and the second is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. And so there's a vein that ties all this together here in chapter 5. It comes up several times. Nehemiah is a man who walks and lives in the fear of God. And the people in Jerusalem at this point are people that are not living in the fear of God. Hence, they are treating their neighbors, their brothers, as people to be traded They didn't realize that the rebuilding process was really about them returning to God. 
That's what it was really about, them returning to God. And Nehemiah is such a great example of this integrity, and he is a foreshadowing of Jesus. So when you're in the Old Testament, you see these incredible characters that do seem to do everything right. This is a picture of who Christ would ultimately be. He is a foreshadowing of this. Look in Mark chapter 10, verses 42 through 45. Jesus called them together. And he said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. But not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's our Lord. That's our King. It's Jesus whom we worship and follow who gave his life for a ransom for many. Remember in Philippians earlier this year, we studied it. The Apostle Paul points to Jesus as the example of how we are to live. That though he was God, he did not cling to his rights as God, but rather he humbled himself and made himself nothing to be obedient to the Father, to the point of death. Why? Paul speaks of that in Titus chapter 2. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. At Christ's expense... At the banquet table, in eternity, at Christ's expense of his own blood, he's redeemed a people, meaning he's purchased them from slavery. That's what Nehemiah is doing. That's what Nehemiah is doing. Is what Christ has done for those who will trust in him. He's purchased them from slavery to sin, so we are a changed people, a saved people, a redeemed people, a, re- a rebuilt people. The integrity from within. What unites such a diverse people as a church globally? Well, we gather around and we look at each other and say, you too? You? God saved you? He, he pulled you out of darkness into his light? You too. He, he forgave your sins? He forgave mine? That's what unites us. Not a collective history. It is Christ, the center of our story, of our lives. We look around and say, he hasn't treated me as my sins deserved. You too? In Ephesians chapter 2, the top of your bolt on the inside, we were far off. We were far away from God's grace and his mercy. We were aliens. We were in exile, slaves to sin, but through Christ's blood, he brought us near to himself. We say to each other, you too? You see how this changes life, it changes community, it changes the world. We see throughout Scripture God's great care for the poor, for the wanderer, the weak, the alien, the immigrant, the exploited, the widow, the fatherless. Over and over and again, God cares for the ones who are spit out by the machine of this world. And you and I, in this church, as we rebuild and move forward, is to model the values of the kingdom of God because he came to you when you were lost. He came to you when you were an alien and a stranger far from God. You didn't just all of a sudden figure it out. Scripture says he opened your eyes to see his grace and his love for you. When you find yourself having no patience for someone who's so different from you, remember God had patience for you. When you have no grace for someone who has wounded you, remember God has graciously given you all things for your good. And yet his, was, he took your sin upon himself. Remember, we are and you are a redeemed people, a holy nation called by God to reflect his glory in the world that he's placed you. The nation of Israel changed. So can you and I. The walls went up and the city was rebuilt, but the strength, the strength came from the community that feared God and loved each other. And with that, they could face any challenge and would see God do great things in their midst in the world that would come. I invite the worship team to come lead us in a closing song, which is in a lot of ways is a closing prayer. That, Lord, we need you. need you in our midst, in our lives. And even in this song, it's a moment to confess. That we've maybe run our own way to do our own things our own way. I invite you to stand, if you're able, and join us in this song.
Father, there's not an hour of our day that goes by, there's not a second, a moment of our lives that go by that we can confidently say that we don't need you. God, we do need you desperately. Would you forgive us for where we've gone our own way and leaned on our own wisdom, our own strength, and in essence built our own kingdom. Father, would you turn us this very day, God, where you've put your finger on our own lives Bring change to us as you changed your people so long ago. So too would you change us now to reflect your kingdom values in our own lives, God, and in us corporately as a church. That those you've given us to care for would know the grace and the love and the mercy of God given and extended to them. And that the city would know that. Would you be pleased to use us to that end, I pray. So to go from here, now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep in the blood of an eternal covenant, even our Lord Jesus, may he equip you with everything good in order to do his will, doing in us what pleases him. Glory is his into the ages and the ages. Amen. Bless you as you go from this place.